Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Seems probably most of us know that by heart. We take comfort in those words. But I suspect that you take comfort in them because you are people of faith and you know what Jesus is speaking of and you know the gift that those words bring. But I suspect that those who were not of faith, if they knew what those words meant, they would never be a Christian. What do I mean? Well, the way that he speaks of, of course, is the way of his cross, the way of suffering and death and, yes, resurrection. The truth is that no one can come to the Father except through Jesus. There is salvation in no other name. That all of your thoughts of worth and of merit and of work are excluded. That salvation comes through Christ and Christ alone. All the other religious schemes of the world are false. Only he and his way is the truth. And of course the way to receive life and life eternal is actually to die. First you die in the waters of baptism, and then you die again. Every time you hear God's word preached, the law convicting you of sin, crucifying in you, again, the old Adam, but then the gospel raising you to new life. If you knew that the life of the Christian, if you knew beforehand, was going to be one of dying daily, would you choose it? Or rather, would you perhaps find a different sort of faith, one that is, well, easier, less convicting, less judgmental, less dependent upon another for salvation. I suspect that that would be the case. But thanks be to God that he does not leave us alone. But Jesus, as we've been hearing in our Sunday preaching, sends his spirit. And it is the spirit that convicts us of, well, of sin and of righteousness of judgment Sin, which is to unbelieve, to not believe in God. Righteousness, that is salvation in Christ and him alone. And judgment, that the ruler of this world is judged, as we heard on Sunday. By the gift of the Spirit, which you've received through the preaching of his word, through the gift of your baptism when the Spirit was anointed upon you, and now that Spirit working daily in your life, you are willing to die, to die with Christ and to be raised with him die to the old Adam and all of its sins and lusts and desires, and to live in righteousness and in faith in Christ each and every day. By the gift of the Spirit, we actually see the sort of Christian life that he gives us to live. And right away, immediately after our Lord's ascension and the preaching of the gospel, many souls were added Peter preached to the 3,000 that were baptized on Pentecost. He preached, you crucified your Lord. And they were convicted, cut to the heart. And they said, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said, believe in Jesus Christ and be baptized in his name, every one of you, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those 3,000 were baptized and then went back to their homes from all around the world, again, preaching that good news that they had heard. That yes, the man that they had crucified, who claimed to be the Messiah, truly was because he rose from the dead and had baptized them and forgiven them. But then we see a different sort of response from the preaching of Jesus, and that's with the first martyr, St. Stephen. We heard the account of Stephen's preaching. He preached the same sort of sermon that Peter did, which convicted those 3,000 that were baptized that day, that received that word. In this case, the response was different. These Hellenists who were disagreeing, or excuse me, these, uh, not the Hellenists, I should say, it was the, uh, the, prosel the, the freedmen, that's it, the freedmen. 
<laughs> the synagogue of the freedmen, the Cyrenians, Alexandrians, those from Cilicia and Asia. There were a bunch of different people mentioned, right? But it was that crowd, they disputed with Stephen. They did not agree with the preaching of the word that he was giving them. This deacon, this layman, who, whose job was to provide for the widows from the collection each and every day, they would collect um, of surplus of food and money and other goods and provide for those women in need. And Stephen preached the same sort of message again as, as Peter. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who foretold of the coming of the just one, and you, of course, are the murderers who betrayed them. And with this, they gnashed their teeth. This time, that preaching of, that was meant to convict them of their sin so that they would turn to Stephen and say, what must we do to be saved? Peter said, believe on Jesus Christ. So Stephen would have be baptized in his name, be forgiven, and receive the gift of the Spirit, the one whom you had denied. But instead, they were cut to the heart and gnashed their teeth and resisted the one who preached, just like the prophets before him. He even confessed that he saw Jesus sitting at the right hand, or standing at the right hand of God. But they, again, resisted this message, and they stoned him. But you'll note that Stephen, well, he knew the way, and he knew the truth, and he knew the life. He knew the way of the Christian is one of, well, death and resurrection. Daily dying and rising in baptism, to be sure, but sometimes, because of the message preached, well, an untimely death, a physical death, long before the Lord uh, would take him naturally, the Lord allowed him to preach to those who would resist him and be stoned. But even as he was being stoned, even as he was going along the way of his suffering and death, like Jesus, who is the truth, he preached the truth. The truth that even as they killed him, Jesus forgives them. First he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, just as Jesus had said at the cross. And then he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Or if you remember Christ from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. So even in his suffering, even in his death, he confessed Jesus to be the truth. Namely, the truth that in Christ, sins are forgiven. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now you might think St. Luke had made a mistake there because clearly he was being stoned and stoned to death. But just as Jesus, when he encounters the dead, says that they're not dead but sleeping, whether it be the young man that was in the funeral bier or it be his friend Lazarus who was in the tomb, as far as Jesus is concerned, the dead sleep with him. And he will, as he has promised to all of his saints, raise them to life and life eternal on the last day. Stephen knew the way, daily dying and rising in baptism. And so Stephen knew that he may suffer at the hands of those who would reject the preaching of his gospel. Would you choose this sort of life if you knew what you were getting into? Would you have chosen to be a Christian if you knew that it meant that, well, some would hate you and even murder you because of the one you put your fear, love, and trust in, namely Jesus, Father, and Spirit? Would you choose, or would you rather resist as those who murdered Stephen? Well, thanks be to God, you actually don't get to choose. Faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit worked through the Word. Baptism is a gift. Water washed upon you and the Spirit coming upon you, whether you like it or like it not. The supper is yours actually because you're a sinner, because you're weak in faith, because you need that strengthening touch of Jesus, forgiving your sins and with forgiveness promising you resurrection whenever your day may come, whatever cross is laid before you, and life everlasting, a life immortal, incorruptible. That was Stephen's hope. 
and it's the truth. So Stephen could die in peace, knowing that the Lord would grant him resurrection on the last day. And so can you. You know the way to the Father, it's through Jesus. Maybe suffering and death along the way. Maybe now or later. You know that he is the truth. That the truth is, Christ rose from the dead, and because he rose from the dead, death has been conquered. You shall not die, but you shall, like Stephen, simply fall asleep and then rest in peace. And you know that in Jesus, there is life. And that life is yours now, as he forgives your sins and will be yours when he calls out your name on the last day and raises you from the dead, like he will for his martyr Stephen. May God grant you comfort in this promise, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.